Seats and uh, rate in your enthusiasm for fellowshipping with one another. We shall give our attention to the agenda coming here. It's nice to see you all enjoy each other's company so much. We'll get down to business. Um, there is a quorum. The uh, my legislative assistant will note the role as we come and go. And the uh, next order of business is let's look at the minutes from the uh, meeting of February 22nd. Chair will entertain a motion. Someone's ready. So move it, Chair. Representative Vogel has moved the minutes. Discussion to them? Seeing none, let's vote. All in favor of signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> the motion prevails. The minutes are adopted. The first bill, we're going to do two of the uh, ag bills right away today because some of our ag friends need to be moving to another committee. So, Representative Benson, let's start with 2102, uh, your bill on U.S. DOT requirements. And I see you have testifiers with you. Mr. Chairman, I uh, House file 20, 2102. I think uh, go to the general register. I go, you pass and go to the general register. Now, um, Mr. Benson, Representative Benson, is this the one with the, no, the uh, license plate bill has the amendment, correct? Correct. All right, this one is uh, as, uh, as it's before us. Please proceed and introduce <coughs> your witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to tell you the background uh, for the committee so that they kind of understand where we're coming from. I have a brother-in-law that uh, farms and uh, his brother's farm and they're section away and uh, they haul their own grain. They don't, ha they don't hire it to, to be done. Uh, because of that, they're not required to have CDL licenses and the like. Except for this just last fall, they, they hauled their grain down an elevator they got a good deal on in Winona. And that, uh, that Winona elevator happened to be a port elevator, and because of that, both of them were stopped. It's in separate, uh, same weekend, but uh, separate instances. Uh, and uh, part, so part of this is an issue of uh, unequal application of the law. And the second is just that addressing the whole idea of of uh, a difference here in between intra and interstate commerce and, and the requirements for individual farmers hauling their own grain currently. So they, they hauled their loads down to Winona and one of them was stopped and they're not only looking for, for what I'm going to talk about but other things but one was told by the officer when he got down there, ah, you know, you, don't, you should have it but that's okay, and don't, don't worry about it. The other one was ticketed because um, the way the, the way the law is written now, that without being registered with the DOT and having that DOT number and pulling their own grain, their own trucks to the port quote port facility with interstate commerce in mind, uh, they have to have that DOT number on there. <clears throat> so, and for me at least, there, there's a couple of other problems uh, that I see with this because uh, during the conversation, uh, what we came to the conclusion was there's many other places if we use it as interstate, not intrastate, as being the definer here, there are many elevators that practically 80, 90 percent of, of what they take in goes to uh, an ethanol refinery uh, in, in another state. Wisconsin happens to be the location that uh, a lot of the grain in an elevator close to, to Rochester or Plainview. Um, so technically that could be interstate. And then uh, in the, the whole process of writing the bill and talking with the folks from the Farm the Farmers Union and, and the Farm Bureau, uh, it was the idea that uh, we're going, to, we're going to start moving more and more of the grain to farm-to-rail processing facilities. In fact, they're going to open one up uh, in a community that I represent, EOTA, in the next couple of years. They get all the permitting correct and all that. So, um, you know, that's technically going to be interstate because who, who can define where, once it gets onto the railroad, where that grain is going to go to? And we'll see more of that. Why? Uh, putting it on rails, more efficient, more environmentally friendly, and, you know, the list goes on. So what the bill is designed to do, and I'm going to allow for um, uh, the testifiers to explain some of the technical things uh, uh, concerning the bill, but ultimately it gives a cutout to make sure that individual farmers uh, trucking their own grain to the elevator within the state boundaries 
are excluded from having to register to get a DOT number, regardless of where it's going to afterwards. Not putting them in a position of, of determining, well, I don't know if the grain is this or that or you know the facility I'm hauling to. Basically, it says if you're hauling within the state of Minnesota, it's your own truck, it's your own grain, you're not required. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Clavin, are you going to go first? Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the, um, Bruce Clavin, for the record, uh, typically I represent clients here uh, on this particular bill. I was doing the legal work for the Farm Bureau. Mr. Raditz is the lobbyist for the Farm Bureau. And so I'm not speaking for any groups other than to explain the technical legal point to the committee here in this bill. And I, and I knew going into this that there was a very technical distinction that we're making here between interstate commerce and intrastate being within the state. As Representative Benson mentioned, we have an exemption for farm trucks, and farm trucks are defined in 168.013. And if you're hauling your own grain and it's not an interstate commerce, you don't need to put the USDOT number on the side. So if you're taking a load from your farm east of Moorhead across into Fargo, you're crossing state lines, you're clearly in interstate commerce, and you have to get a USDOT number, even if it's your own farm truck and even if it's your own grain. The issue got to be at the ports. And this goes back to a case in 1983 that was brought here in the Eighth Circuit about the movement of grain to a barge terminal. And the case is called Northwest Terminal Elevator Association, and the issue before them at that time was the state PUC had a state law that required them to charge the elevators for time waiting in line. And so the issue was, does the state have the authority to enforce rate charges for people waiting in line at a grain elevator. And the court said, well, that's interstate commerce because the nature of the shipment is such that you're going to leave the state. If you haul to the Wilmer elevator, maybe not. But if you're in Red Wing, Winona, or Shakopee, you intend for the grain to leave the state. Therefore, it's interstate commerce. Therefore, the PUC does not have the authority to impose the minimum deals for, for waiting in line. Didn't address farm trucks, didn't address your own grain, and it was the commercial motor vehicle drivers who did it for hire. The second one I wanted to reference was later on in 98, there was an insurance coverage question in a, in a case called Century Indemnity. Similar deal. If the movement was intrastate within the state, the insurance didn't apply, but if it was interstate, then the insurance policy covered. Of course, there was an accident, a widow, the whole thing, and the question was, was did, did the insurance attach? And because the driver, again, was a commercial motor vehicle for hire, hauling somebody else's grain to a barge terminal, the court said, oh, that's that interstate movement. They cited Northwest Grain Terminal, and the coverage attached. So what we did in the bill, knowing this, was we went into 168.185, as you'll see in the bill, line 1.21. We tried not to monkey with the definition of interstate in 221.0314, we went specifically into the exemption that's recognized by both the feds and the state that a farm truck with someone hauling their own grain is exempt from a USDOT number, and we tried to fit it in there and say, if you don't leave the physical boundaries of the state, you're not considered interstate commerce. I recognize, I want to disclose to the committee, we know that there are some issues with the feds. Do the feds have to change this? Can we monkey with this? I've talked to the patrol about that. But we tried to thread the needle very finely here to get at this concept of if on Monday you haul to Shakopee and Scott County, you need your federal tracking number on the side of your truck. But if you go north, south, or, or west on Tuesday, then you can take your federal tracking number off. And that's, that's sort of what we're trying to get at, is the ridiculous government result in that situation. Well, Mr. Clavin, uh, Representative Biskins is having a cow over here because those terminals are actually in Savage, which is the district he represents. <laughs> I would love to claim them in Shakopee, but alas, we have Valley Fair. So. <laughs> All right, is there a serious question for Mr. Clayton, Representative Housen? Uh, not of them, but I just wondered if, if we're going to hear from State Patrol. Do they have we, a... We may be. They haven't signed up to testify, but I will be asking if they'd like to comment on the bill. Thank you. I would be interested. Good deal. Uh, Mr. Raditz, so welcome to the committee. Would you like to make some comments before we ask for other testifiers? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is Chris Raditz. I'm the Public Policy Director for Minnesota Farm Bureau. Um, just to uh, add a few uh, comments to what's already been said, uh, we're supporting this bill because it clarifies when a farmer would need that USD DOT number or not. Um, in addition to the uh, situations that Representative Benson mentioned, 
uh, farmers in Scott County, and I'm not sure which legislative district they crossed or not, but uh, they were hauling their own. <laughs> they were hauling their own grain, literally less than 10 miles, uh, to Savage, and then they needed the DOT number. If they weren't hauling to Savage, they did. Uh, it, it just drives up the cost of doing uh, farmers' business, adds more red tape to uh, their cost of business. And the other point that I'd like to make is that uh, when a farmer sells his grain, he sells it to a grain buyer. Then the grain buyer says, well, it should be delivered here or there or, or wherever that location is. The farmer doesn't have control of where that grain <coughs> ends up. So we don't have that control once the grain is sold. Uh, so that's why we feel that uh, that DOT number should not be required uh, if it's hauled to a river terminal versus a different terminal. Uh, so we support this bill, and Mr. Peterson from the Farmers Union is up there, and um, Farmers Union is also in support of this bill. Uh, we just uh, would encourage the uh, committee to pass the bill. We think it will provide some consistency uh, and help reduce the cost of doing business for Minnesota farmers. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, questions for either Mr. Clavin or Mr. Uh, uh, Raditz at the moment. Uh, Representative Gauthier. Representative Gauthier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Benson or Mr. Raditz, um, if this passed, would there be any danger of losing federal funds to the state? Either uh, Mr. Raditz or Mr. Clevin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can take that. Um, I've visited with the state patrol and on and off over the years. They do say that we will that we do risk losing federal funding in what's called the mix-up account, which is the inspection account. I've never seen the letter. I don't know what it would be or how much. I've heard various numbers <coughs> over the years. When we did try to do truck bumpers three or four years ago so that they would actually fit into the sugar beet pilers and, act and dump the truck without spilling, we tried to move the bumpers a few inches and we're told we could not do that because at that time it was $4 million. Um, the number I heard uh, last week in discussing this with the patrol ahead of this committee hearing was $600 million. Those are the two numbers I've heard and I don't know any more than that. It is, Representative Gutke, a serious question because the feds routinely hold that club over our head to make us do all kinds of things that they think are in our best interest. Uh, Representative Biskin, <laughs> follow up before I go to Biskin. Um, I'll wait. All right, Representative Biskin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a quick question. Is every grain of grain that's uh, hauled to the Port of Savage <coughs> go uh, out of the state of Minnesota? Mr. Clevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Biskins, as far as we know, it does. Because when you go to a barge terminal, the only place is out the other end of the, of the unit to the, to the barge onto the water. I don't know if it would stop along the way from, say, Savage to a flour mill in Wabasha, for example. I couldn't tell you that. Well, Representative Biskins. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Then your testimony is that you don't know. Not that, yes, it all does go out of the state of Minnesota, because the Ports of Savage, the waterway, uh, for quite a long distance is still contained within the state of Minnesota, correct? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Biskins, yes. And, Thank you. And uh, our, uh, my reading of that was from what the court, what the judges in the Eighth <coughs> Circus told us was happening at the barge terminals. Thank you. Further questions for these testifiers before I ask for other testifiers? Uh, Mr. Uh, Raditz. Could I add just one uh, sure. additional piece of information, too, that um, these farm trucks are annually inspected, safety inspected, so it's, I think it's important to remember uh, that farm trucks have an annual safety inspection that uh, they go through. Good. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify concerning this bill, um, either for or against uh, patrol? I'm not seeing anyone heading down here. Anyone else? Um, Representative Houseman, did you have specific questions you wanted to ask the patrol? Because I will ask them if they would like to come down, if they would approach. I, Captain? Yeah, I, I always wonder, want to know about unintended consequences, Certainly. and I thought they might be a good... But let's have him have a seat, identify himself, and then you can ask him that question. <laughs> I'm Captain Tim Rogatsky. I'm the commander of the uh, Minnesota State Patrol Commercial Vehicle Section. Thank you for coming down. Representative Hausman, you want to frame the question? For um, well, I, I always uh, worry about unintended consequences when we move in a new direction, and I just wondered if you have any, any uh, can, can shed any light on that. Captain? Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, Mr. Clavins, uh, I talked to him last week, and the $600 million that we were talking about was for the civil weight bill highway 
issues. Mm -hmm. uh, the basic mix app uh, grant that we were talking about that would pertain to this bill, if it conflicts with the definition of interstate commerce, would be um, currently our basic mix app grant is $4.1 million. Captain, would you define what MITSAP means for those of us that don't have that acronym on our... That's our uh, Motor Carrier Safety Assistance Program. And that's a grant that we receive, we apply for each year from Federal Motor Carrier. We fill out a plan, we explain to them in great detail what it is that we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and what we hope to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Would you make that uh, available to the committee? at least to the chairs and the ranking members whenever you do that again this year? Or is that being done already? I can do that, but Mr. Thank Chair. You. Thank you. I Just since you brought it up, thank you. Representative Houseman, do you have a follow-up before I see a couple other questions here? Uh, no. I, I guess, in other words, there is a difference of opinion on whether there is a, a cost. Um, would you, is that how you heard this, too? Uh, uh, probably the amount of the cost, but perhaps we'll let Mr. Uh, Clevin speak to that. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Husband. Uh, thank you for correcting me. We talked about two bills in the hallway. Okay. The other one was Representative Keels, and I think that was the, the more expensive one that's coming up later. But it, but, I, but I want to stand corrected on that. It was $4 million from what we heard. So the, uh, I think what I heard Representative Houseman was that the four point some million well, actually goes to the patrol for commercial vehicle enforcement probably wouldn't come out of the roads and bridges account. but. Uh, so there is that would be could possibly be at risk. I think that's what we heard. Uh, and and maybe just just to follow up in, um, uh, and maybe I missed it. Um, mm -hmm. Are there other states that um, that this is uh, that exclude these trucks? Do we know? Do Can we anyone know? speak to that at the table there, <coughs> Mr. Mr. Rad? It's because uh, Farm Bureau reaches across many state lines. Yeah, Do other states uh, treat their intrastate like this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chris Raddatz, Farm Bureau. Um, I did visit with my colleagues in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and from what they told me, that in Wisconsin, that this was not the case. That if a farm truck hauling their own grain without ca crossing state boundaries delivered to a river terminal, they weren't required to get a USDOT number. We're not? We're not. We're not, okay. That's my understanding. If somebody has other information, I'd be happy to get that input, but that's what I learned. Thank you. Um, Representative Leidiger is next on the list here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Raddatz, the, um, bringing up Wisconsin, uh, how would they, how, do you know how they handle the, the federal funds that would come in uh, to their state? I mean, I can only imagine that the, if there was an issue there, that they would do something different. But in fact, they're, <coughs> They're, uh, uh, it, you know, they're doing something we want to do. I don't think that they're going to forego federal funds. And Mr. Raddis, can you speak to that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't ask that question, uh, but it, it would seem common sense that they must not have that fund at risk. But I think that's something that we should obviously explore and get some answers. Follow up. Uh, no, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank Representative you. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess um, maybe to the State Patrol, maybe maybe uh, Mr. Burgett, Burgess can help me, uh, Rurs can help me. Um, what's the cost of this license, this, this DOT license? Because if, if, I'm thinking, I got cousins that farm, and they actually farm down the Iowa border, and so they probably would have to have this because if they go off their south, off their farm, they're probably in Iowa. Um, but uh, what's the cost of this MIN dot this um, U.S. DOT licensing? What does the cup permit cost? Captain Rogowitz, Rogowski, sorry, Rogowski. Mr. Chair, Representative, the cost currently is free to apply for a U.S. DOT number. <laughs> Interesting. Well, Representative Morrow. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, Captain, I just have a couple of questions. I want to make sure I understand, I think, the response to Representative Houseman. Uh, concerning the 4.2 million, is this a definite loss of the money if we pass this law? Captain, can you speak to that? Mr. Chair, I, I'm not prepared at this particular time what the details are, but I can tell you that North Dakota experienced this 
and some legislations, and I do have the letter that was sent from Federal Motor Carrier to them that I would provide to you. And this was a rear end protection issue a couple years ago. Was this related to the sugar beet question that we just talked about a moment ago? I believe it was. All right, Mr. Chair. Question. Uh, Representative Morrill, follow up. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Captain. I want to make sure you said something at the very end about the rear end. Was that what you just said? If you could just explain what that was That's referring what I was to. Referring to Captain Rogotsky. Mr. Chair, Representative. Uh, I'm recollecting this was a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, North Dakota wanted to make some changes in their rear end protection in in the sugar beet <coughs> or other vehicles, and they the rear end protection definition and dimensions did not coincide with the federal regulations, and they did suffer sanctions for that. Mr. Clevin, can you speak to that issue too and refresh our memory? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, that's my recollection as well. Uh, the beet industry is split in the valley on, on each side of the river. North Dakota went ahead and changed their state law to allow the bumper change. And I think they did. I don't. I guess I can't speak to whether they fell out of the money. Um, Patrol would know that better than I do, but I believe that was what the issue was. The issue was Minnesota did not do it. Representative Morrill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate you allowing me to ask this series of questions. Mr. Chair, we do have a fiscal note from February 14, 2012, which says there's zero fiscal impact. Yep. Uh, I, I fully respect the patrol, and I have had a chance to work with the patrol on a number of issues, Mr. Chair. But it seems to me that the difference here and in, between the, this and the North Dakota situation is the North Dakota situation was involving a safety feature, the rear bumper. Whereas here, I think we're dealing with more of a constitutional question, what constitutes interstate commerce? Uh, for that purpose, I think the feds may have a harder time challenging us, especially if uh, Mr. Raddatz is correct, and I would assume he is, that Wisconsin seems to be able to avoid this problem of, of a challenge or losing money. So, Mr. Chair, I just, uh, that's not a question, but a statement. I plan to vote for this bill. I think that if we want to make a constitutional definition of what constitutes interstate commerce in a very reasonable fashion, uh, if we are then threatened with losing funding, we could then revisit this issue. But if a sister state has done this, it seems reasonable to the legislature that a truck moving 10 miles within state should not all of a sudden have to get a number that wouldn't have to get going 20 miles to somewhere else. Thank you for your comments. Representative Biskin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Captain Rogotsky, could you uh, just tell us again, what is the purpose of the USDOT number? Captain. When a carrier apply, Mr. Chair, when a carrier applies for a USDOT number, their information, basic information, is tracked in, in, in Washington D.C. And there's a clearinghouse of USDOT numbers by carrier. And uh, safety is the ultimate goal for this, for capturing data on their drivers, on their equipment, on their crash causation, and factors similar to that. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. So safety is primary concern, and I get that. Um, you mentioned that uh, the assignment of a USDOT number is actually free. What is the cost of a fine? Uh, Captain? About will be close enough. Mr. Chair, it would be about $185 for a, the fine okay. for UCR fee. Follow-up, Representative? Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, members of this committee, if safety is the concern, all right, then I wonder why, if you go back to that farmer in Shakopee, if the farmer in Shakopee takes his produce to the Ports of Savage, which is about four miles from Shakopee, he has to have the USDOT number, and if he forgets or doesn't realize that he has to pay $180, however, if he takes his grain to his sewer um, and the Green Giant plant, which is almost 40 miles away, then he's fine. All right. If safety is the primary concern, then we're way out of whack here all right, in how we're applying uh, safety concerns, um, and, and I think we need to think about this. I'm all for this bill, and I was almost uh, going to ask, Mr. Chair, however, the questioning has uh, convinced me otherwise uh, whether or not we should put this on the consent calendar, personally. Thank you for your comments. Representative Gauthier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Clevens, uh, in regards to interstate commerce, and you gave us a, a 
reference to the court. Um, my question, I guess, is um, I'm not willing to go down the road to be fighting with the feds in court. So what is the, um, in the reference of moving um, farm goods, what is the uh, government, the federal government's in, uh, definition of interstate commerce? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Gauthier. The, the federal government looks at the nature of the shipment. Yeah. And that's the test they use. And in visiting with the patrol about that, that could go to gasoline and fertilizer and all kinds of stuff. I suppose in theory, this pen is interstate commerce because it came from somewhere. Uh, I think that's the way they would look at it. And I think that's probably where they want to go long term. We also learned that railheads, unit train loaders, are potentially considered in here. Now the court cases, the two that I cited, involved the ter barge terminals. We're also hearing that that may apply to railhead loaders, which can be right in the middle of the state and you might never leave the county. But that may also be considered interstate eventually. Or maybe it is now. Um, I guess my next question is, and I don't know who can answer this, maybe Mr. Raditz. Um, <clears throat> Because there seems to be an assumption that if we deposit these goods somewhere, it's going to be interstate commerce. And so um, so if we're taking it from the farm to the end product, and it's an ethanol plant in Minnesota, then I would say it's intrastate. But if we don't know what's going to the ethanol plant, then I would think the federal government saying we have to assume it's interstate. So unless we specifically know, a little different than Mr. Uh, uh, Representative Biskin's uh, point about this, unless we specifically know what's going to a plant of some type, whether it be a General Mills plant and make Cheerios or whatever, um, then we have to assume it's interstate. Mr. Chairman, quickly, <clears throat> uh, as a follow-up, uh, I get what you're saying. That then would then apply to an ethanol plant. We know where it's going. Any other elevator could go anywhere. It right. could actually go back to a closer farm as feed. Yep. So our point is once we drop it off, we don't know. Uh, but the court has told us in the case of a barge terminal, it's going out of state. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Representative Leidiger, you had a follow-up. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. The uh, I actually have two of them now because of this, this last uh, idea. It seems to me that ownership has a lot to do with interstate commerce. I mean, we're talking about uh, the farmers bringing it to the elevators. And I know in most all other businesses, uh, you usually sell your goods prior to, uh, to ever shipping it to the ultimate destination. So it seems to me in the majority of the cases, uh, once once it reaches the elevator, uh, the farmers no longer really have ownership of the product. Now, I don't know what to, to degree that is true, um, but I would imagine it is to a great deal of the times. Or it sits there until a, an ultimate owner of that product is determined and money is exchanged, etc. So, I mean, let's look at the purpose of this bill is to... Uh, we want to save some dollars uh, for the farmers, and, which leads me uh, then, and you can answer, you can comment on both of these, but it leads me to the, the whole idea of, of, uh, of saving dollars here. Now, I know um, uh, the testifier talked about the cost of the DOD, DOT licenses free, but I've owned uh, some DOT vehicles in my time, and I remember uh, the internal costs to an organization is, is uh, substantial. The record keeping is substantial for uh, keeping, uh, you know, all the information about a DOT vehicle. Now, that, those are internal costs that a farmer would no longer have to incur. Uh, there's also routine inspections that have to be paid for that I remember. Uh, there's also something uh, something about the driver, uh, and I'm not sure what that is, but can someone speak to the cost other than 
uh, just the cost of the license. I, I remember this as being a huge program within a company to, 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 uh, uh, to manage these DOT vehicles. Mr. Clevin, you may respond to that. Sure. The chair has a little experience with this, too, and I just about jumped out of my chair when I heard that the cost of a DOT number was zero. Yeah. It's anything but, but Mr. Clevin, if you Thank you, and quickly, that. Mr. Chairman, on your first point, uh, once the grain's delivered, and I'm sure many of you have seen grain elevators, there are hundreds of thousands of bushel bins. Once it goes in there, you won't be able to trace your grain. In fact, bankruptcy courts consistently have said, uh, once it goes in there, it's commingled. Mm -hmm. And then it's a property elevator, and when they sort it out in bankruptcy, you'll never get your stuff back. So commingling, yeah, once it's dumped, we don't know where it goes, typically. Um, on the cost, once you're in the USDA program, Every 24 months, you have to file an MSC 150, which is a reporting form. I assume that covers log books and CDLs and all the stuff, but we're exempt from all that, typically. So you can be interstate, stay just in Minnesota, get a US DOT number for free, then every two years file your report, and we don't have to put down our log books or CDL stuff. In most cases, we're exempt from the medical cards because we're hauling our own stuff generally locally on the same roads we grew up with. Typically, we're not going from Maine to Oklahoma with a load of lobster. We're staying local on the, on the, in the places we know. So that's typically what we see. I've never filled out an MSC 150 because most of the folks I deal with don't have to get them. Well, the chair will stand corrected then if it's intrastate DOT and the reporting requirements are less than if you're a commercial operator, you're saying, correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we would have to file the report once we're involved in the yes. tracking system of the US DOT scheme. All right. Now, how much we have to do from that point, I don't know, because a lot of it would probably be zeros on the logbook and so forth. I've never sure. filled one out. Okay. But then, of course, if you don't fill it out, there's probably a fine for not filling it out every 24 months. Oh, I'm sure. Representative Nelson. I don't know what that is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think part of that was already answered with, with Representative Leidiger's question, but. I heard earlier that they, these trucks are inspected once a year, so there's no additional inspection that has to go on, um, at least in my mind. That's the question I'm, I guess i got to ask here, because, again, is there co additional cost? I mean, if they had to be inspected more often, what I'm hearing now is that they have to fill out, if it's they got a USD OT number, they've got to file, file a form once every two years. Um, it's Because I, I like Representative Leidiger, when you say there's no additional cost, I, I find it hard to believe that there's not other costs. I mean, filling out a form, I don't know if it's one or two trucks. I don't know how much of an uh, imposition that is on somebody. Um, but uh, I guess the question is, is there, there – and there's no additional um, inspections that are required. I guess I find it hard to believe there's no additional cost. Take that as a comment to the committee. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Representative Morrow. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, maybe Mr. Clavin can help me out here. I was trying to think about whether there was an analogy for me uh, selling stuff on eBay, taking it to FedEx, which is going to fly it out of town. And now do I have to have a USDOT number, but I'm going to put that aside. Uh, the barge is certainly interstate commerce. The train is certainly, I know that we've got our friends from Twin City Western here. They're certainly interstate commerce, and they're regulated by the feds. But I think, Mr. Claven, aren't we talking about the guy who uh, is just looking at where he's getting his best shipping rate? And he's been taking his grain, taking his corn, taking his beans to the, to the elevator. But maybe 10 years ago, before Katrina, he was taking it to Savage. But now he's getting a better rate at the rail in Hanska. Well, for the elevator, he doesn't need the US DOT. But all of a sudden, he's, on his, uh, he's uh, figured out that it's better to take it to Savage or better to take it to Hanska. Doesn't know he needs a US DOT. He's never needed one. What we're saying is, now we need that guy to get a US DOT number painted on, you know, apply, get it painted on. I hope the, hope the rate, shipping rates don't change while you're going through that process, and then take your stuff, take your, your corn, your beets, your. Uh, but the, the, the vehicles are inspected. They're licensed. The drivers are licensed. They don't have a CDL if they're hauling their own stuff. So it's really not less safe for Minnesotans whether or not the US DOT number is on there. And it's not unreasonable that a farmer wouldn't have the US DOT number. It depends where the best ship shipping rate is. And now we're going to ask our farmers to be well-versed in interstate commerce law when even lawyers have a hard time with interstate commerce law. So do I understand the situation correctly? This is really a situation in which farmers are choosing their shipping spot, and depending on where they ship from, they do or do not need a number which does not enhance safety, they still need an annual safety inspection. 
Mr. Clement. Mr. Chairman, I would echo everything he just said. Thank yeah. you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for, against, or about this bill? Seeing no movement, uh, but Captain, thank you for your comments, for standing for questions. Representative Benson, would you like to renew your motion that the bill pass be referred? Thank to you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to renew my motion that this bill pass and be uh, placed on the general register. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion no. prevails. The bill is on its way to the general register. Thank you, uh, uh, Representative Benson. Uh, we're going to step away from Representative Benson and do another uh, agriculture-related bill because there's some other ag folks that need to move along. Representative Keel, um, Representative Keel, move House Cell 2058. Um, and I think we may have to lay this one over for a, a couple of days. Yes, um, Mr. Chair. So if you'd move it to get in front of the committee, that'd be great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I would like to move House File 2058 to be laid over at this point. Okay. Representative Field, you want to go ahead and explain your bill and we'll start talking about. Oh, you have a DE1 amendment. Also. Yes, we need to move my DE1 Please amendment. Move the DE1 amendment and we'll adopt that amendment to get the bill in the shape. Could I move? Please do. Would I? Uh, would you please uh, move the DE1 amendment? The DE1 amendment's in front of us, members, in order for uh, Representative Keel to get the bill in the condition in which she'd like to explain it. Questions, comments, seeing none, all in favor signify by aye. 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 Uh, opposed? The motion prevails. Your bill has been amended with the DE1 amendment. Representative Keel. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, this has been an interesting uh, uh, bill. Uh, I want you to know that I'm a farmer. I, uh, m I do the marketing on my farm. So I've had personal and intimate knowledge in, in uh, how this all works. Um, I've never been stopped by, by the uh, law enforcement uh, to weigh a truck, so I haven't had that experience. Um, but um, this encompasses quite a bit of different issues, and as you see the testifiers come forward, you'll understand even more deeply how this affects us in the rural areas. Um, and with that, instead of going through each of the details, or would you like me to, Mr. Chair, go through the details of the bill? Well, there aren't that many. There's uh, no. places where you're altering. One, the mileage, and the other is the, uh, uh, the days. explanation of uh, why the dates would change. That uh, is why correct. Why don't you speak first to the mileage? Uh, okay. Um, first of all, uh, moving the mileage from 50 miles to 150 miles, I have talked to uh, farmers. Up in our, in our uh, rural area, there is uh, uh, some distance sometimes between uh, where they haul the, the wheat, soybeans, uh, crop, whatever, um, to from the field to an elevator in their farm or else at, at, um, at actually um, an elevator site where the uh, product is brought. And uh, some of these fellows are telling me that they're having to drive um, upwards of over 100 miles just one way to get that crop uh, uh, to the elevator. Um, and this, this involves a first haul, so that you all know that this is a first haul, which means it goes from the elevator to the uh, uh, facility or else from the field to the facility or the field to the elevator. Um, those all are, are places that it goes. So. Um, and then um, the other issue is uh, law enforcement has been allowed to um, uh, come into the elevator and look at our weights on our trucks. And um, I would like to reduce that from 14 days to seven. Um, and we'll have some conversation about how that is. But um, I don't know. I've even talked to some that feel that that's questionable when we're going after uh, paperwork without a warrant because that's personal information or private business information. So, um, and it does cause some issues at the elevator. Uh, but I will, have, I will say this, that I believe this is a compromise because uh, the other solution is to stop trucks on the side of the road. And you could have upwards of, oh, 10 uh, considerable amount of trucks being weighed on the side of the road, and sometimes that becomes a safety issue. Law enforcement will address that. The other concern is is that um, the final one is that we uh, ask that law enforcement um, send a ticket in the 30, first 30 days after the truck has been identified as overweight, um, partly because um, my fellow uh, farmers are seeing these uh, tickets 90 plus days uh, later, and um, of course they're done hauling whatever product they're hauling by that time. And um, I, as one uh, grower told me this last weekend, uh, he had 10 trucks that were overweight by the time he had received the fine. So 
uh, those are the concerns that, that I have. Um, I have uh, with me uh, Mr. Clavin, and I would uh, like him to address the issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Hill. Uh, Mr. Clavin, welcome back to the committee. If you identify yourself. Please. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for the record, I represent the Minnesota Association of Wheat Growers on this bill. Uh, Representative Keel laid out uh, this, the DE1 very uh, clearly. Uh, maybe some additional information. Again, this is sort of technical in nature, but uh, back to the 150 miles. What this section is about, it's not hauling 150 miles carte blanche. This is about how the scale house tickets are used. In fact, all three sections of this bill are about how scale tickets are used. There are two ways to get a weight violation in the state. One is on the portable scales by the side of the road and the other is if the state patrol goes into a scale house and in our case again we're talking about grain elevators primarily. You get to a scale house. They go in and look at the tickets. It's completely at random and they choose the elevator and they go in and, and go through. So there are two ways to get it. And I always like to use semis because they're easy math. Uh, a semi can haul 80,000 pounds legally. So if you leave your farm on your first haul and you're one pound overweight. You can you are subject to an overweight fine on the side of the road at any time the patrol happens to come along. So if you leave your field or you leave your farm site overweight, you are always at risk on the highway for getting a ticket. What this section talks about is the first haul. The second way is if the if you make it to the elevator and you might be a thousand pounds overweight and your truck weighs eighty one thousand. What this section means is the state patrol cannot use that ticket to send you a fine in the mail after the fact. Remember photocop in Minneapolis, the dust up about photocop. This is a similar deal in that you ran the red light, two weeks later the ticket shows up. And I'm not justifying the lawbreakers here, I'm explaining how the process works. So you make it to the elevator. If your load is more than 10% over, if you're 89,000 say, then the patrol can send you the fine in the mail. So the first haul here, and you'll see on line 3.16, more than 10%. That's the 10% I'm talking about. Some guys, when they leave the field, have to go farther than 50 miles from the place of production, which is the field, or the on-farm storage to get to the elevator. So this is about how the ticket is used if you get there. But you're always, always subject to portable inspection when you're on the highway. So you're taking a risk if you're one pound over. I know the railroads are here and some others. I can't wait to hear the concern because this is about from the field or the farm to town. And I know they don't like the mileage stretch, or at least I've heard they don't. Unless they're going to run tracks to every field, I, I don't see the concern here. Because this is about the way you use the weight tickets once you get there. All right, secondly, um, flipping over uh, 4.1, I should tell you that the old law, and I should say the old law, about 8, 10 years ago, this used to be 30 days and then it was moved to 14. Uh, some of the growers want to go to 7, some have said 10, um, but reducing it, some want to go to 0. Some want to throw this out. They don't like the patrol going in the, into the scale house. There's some quiet tension we've had as, as farm groups with the patrol over the years in that if that goes away, now it's all portables. Now it's all roadside. There may be safety concerns there. Uh, it's sunny and 70, you're trying to get the crop in, and now you have to sit by the side of the road. So. We, we've had sort of this quiet tension. We understand that that's a, a, a tool that can be used on their part. But uh, the bill reduces that to seven days. I do want to tell you at one time it was 30, and it was moved to 14 again about eight, 10 years ago. Yeah. And then lastly, as Representative Keel mentioned, uh, the 30 days, once they get the ticket, I've had guys call me on, on overweights that were done in August that come near Christmas. This was been, has been a few years ago. When I was talking with the patrol in the hall last week about both these bills, they were mentioning that their policy is 90 days, and that's the first I had heard about that. This DE1 was done before I could talk to them. If this number needs to be moved, um, 45, 60 something, I, I'm recognizing that they do do that in terms of policy. We'd like to codify it. So I did have that conversation with them. But essentially, that's the bill. So to be clear then, uh, Mr. Clevin, if I can just start the discussion here, and we got a couple other test fires. The, the first haul out of the field, um, they can do 10% over without being penalized under the existing setup, which should then give a reasonably astute driver an idea of what's 10% over. They could load a little less the second time. And so they'd have at least some sort of a benchmark knowing how wet the corn was or the beans or beets, whatever it is. Would that be a fair assumption? Mr. Chairman, yes, it would be. 
And in yeah. fact, uh, keep in mind that every time you leave the field, mm -hmm. if you're over 80,000 on a semi, you're at risk for the portables. This has <clears> to do if you make it all the way in to the elevator somehow. When they go through the books. And that's why they go through, and they do have that allowance. So, you know, we recognize that there is that allowance there, but you're taking a risk every time you go to the elevator over 80,000. Understood. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Nelson, before we go to the next testifier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess the concern I have, and I guess the channeling representative leader on this is um, when we're raising the 50 to 150 miles, the number of, I mean, that just increases the number of possible fracture critical bridges we're going to be covering. And even though the roadway might be able to handle it, a lot of those older bridges cannot handle that extra weight, and we're diminishing the life of those. And I guess that's a concern I have. Um, although I, when you mentioned the photocop, I, you know, I can kind of understand that also. I have some concerns about photocop. You're ticketing the car and not the driver, um, and going back you know, 90 days later and get a ticket. You know, you're ticketing a, a vehicle, not the driver of the vehicle. Um, there's going to be some issues there with that, but I mean, that's a concern I have. And we got we have roads out there that aren't are all 10-ton roads, and, and we have bridges that aren't 10-ton bridges that if we're going to just increase the wear and tear on those bridges and those roads and have future costs for the state as a whole or those counties as a whole um, later on down the road. That's a concern I have. Um, I, under, they said I have some sympathy for this, but that's a question I question a concern I have. Thank you for your comments. Representative Hausman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mine is just a comment uh, <clears throat> also. Um, we used to hear from the counties on these. They've probably given up on us because we always grant all this stuff anyway, and they keep telling us what the cost is, and, and we don't care. Um, but when I look at the fiscal note, I also see uh, the potential loss of up to six, $60 million of federal highway funding is due to the lack of a certification to our weight enforcement activities. So we have a loss of revenue, but we also shorten the overall life expectancy of roads and highways. So it's... Um, uh, it's only an observation. We keep doing this, but <clears throat> um, just a conflict of two values. Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank you for your comments. Representative Keel. Um, you know, to that, I would, I would say that I, I very much understand the concerns about the roads and bridges um, and the bridges, uh, consequently why I carried the bridges bill, um, because I know in our rural areas we, we need to make sure that our roads are enforced. <laughs> Uh, up to the 10 ton roads and um, and concerns about the bridges um, but the other take on this is that we need to make sure that our our product which is the mainstay of the rural area is 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 able to get to um, uh, sale and um, and to be able to haul it efficiently um, I realize our vehicles our trucks are, are getting bigger um, and that is a concern, although my understanding is the smaller trucks we used to drive were harder on our roads than our, our semis are now. I kind of drew the line, Mr. Chair, when I uh, was driving tandem trucks and my son said, uh, you can drive a semi, Mom, and I said, you know what, I think I'm not going to learn how to do that. So <laughs> but I, my understanding is that they are more effective, and of course we can haul more that way, getting our crops in uh, much quicker and uh, with less trucks, tr truck traffic on the road also. But I do recognize the fact that we need to make sure our roads are capable of hauling that also. Before I go to Representative Gauthier, um, just a note, the fiscal note that Representative Hausman referred to is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, was developed on the original bill before the amendment. But that's a very astute observation, Representative Hausman. Representative Gauthier, and then I have two or three other witnesses I'm going to call down members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Keel, not being a farmer but a city boy, uh, so when you guys are loading trucks, you pretty much have a good idea of how much you're putting in those trucks. You, um, you kind of know when you're at 80,000. Representative Keel, is that a good statement? I'm just trying to figure this out here. Right, right. Generally, you have some idea, although it, it sometimes depends on uh, how wet the wheat is, the corn, um, or even how much poundage it is. Wheat can be 58 um, it can be 63 pounds. Uh, you know, I like it. I like it to be heavier. It's uh, worth more. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, you know, it it takes a couple of loads sometimes to know uh, how full the truck can be. Uh, the one thing that is going to make this mute in uh, future years probably is going to take a little while is 
Uh, implement dealers are now selling, uh, we don't own one of those, but a cart that um, the combines often fill the cart, and that will have a scale on it. Okay. Um, I understand that our, our beat lifters are also, the newer ones are now coming with uh, uh, weights on them too, so we'll understand how that is, which will be very helpful. But it will take some time to get that turned around. So. Okay. Got the follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So it takes a couple of loads, and, and that's, uh, my guess would be then that's why you have the 10% rule first haul. for first haul. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Clevin, I guess I, I get alarmed when you say uh, you're at risk. I mean, after a couple of loads, you know whether or not you're breaking the law. Mr. Clevin? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Guppy. Um, saying at risk meaning for a ticket, for an overweight ticket, right. is what I mean by that. So. Once you know, you should try to keep it under 80000 on the semi. If you don't, you don't get 10% on every load, every movement. It's, if they, it's how they use the scale house tickets once you get there. That's what the first haul is about. Perhaps, so, perhaps we should have uh, Captain uh, <laughs> uh, Rogotsky come back and explain the scale house scenario so we understand exactly what we're talking about, members. Um, Captain Rogotsky, welcome back to the committee. Uh, if you'd like to uh, talk about the bill as amended and make us a little smarter about how the scale house uh, thing works, we'd appreciate that. Yes, Mr. Chair. Actually, there's three different ways that a carrier or a truck can be weighed. One of them is our ports. We have fixed scale facilities throughout the state as well, and that's where the bulk of our personnel are assigned. We um, The civil weight uh, portion, I also wanted to note that that 10% would be 88,000 pounds. So when I go into a scale uh, to look at uh, weight slips, I won't pull a bill under 88,000 pounds. And when the 10% increase is on for the winter, we won't pull a bill that's under 96,000 pounds. So that's the challenge for us then is to determine whether or not this is a first haul move or not. And it's common practice from our personnel if they if they see uh, Jones Farms, for example, on a weight slip that's 85,000 pounds, and then the next slip that is lower, and then the next slip is lower, and then they're under 80,000. We won't file a case on that carrier. Now, I personally filed multiple civil weight cases, and. I've seen what would get our attention is if there's a progressive weight increase. The first load is 73,000, the next one is 82,000, the next one is 83,000 from the same carrier in a progressive manner over one or two days. Then there's, it just shows just us that there's a disregard for uh, the weight loss. Does that answer the question, Mr. Chair? Very helpful. Yes, thank you. Um, question, Representative Gottlieb. Can I follow you want to up then? Certainly. Uh, so, Representative Hill, in light, uh, mm -hmm. Hill, in light of that, so reducing from 14 to 7 days is really about enabling people who knowingly are violating the law. I guess that's what I'm hearing. Um, um, so enlighten me. Yes, I, no, it would be, and maybe um, Captain Rogotsky can clear this up too. It it means that um, they have 14 days to look at those tickets. It doesn't mean that I've been hauling for 14 right. days, um, because a field, I can be done with a field in a day. Uh, so that just gives them a little more time to look at the tickets. Uh, Your bill will give them Representative Gauthier. Right, that's correct. Uh, Representative Peel. Mm -hmm. uh, is the exchange. Uh, that's good. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, Captain uh, Rogotsky, um, uh, it was touched on a few moments ago, one about uh, a, a pretty much a civil liberties issue. Uh, part of the problem, a lot of us had heartburn with the photocop was uh, there actually wasn't a sworn officer witnessing the infraction. We're doing it after the fact. Uh, you know personally I've got some real heartburn about uh, some zealous officers that are standing in rush hour traffic and mailing citations for window tint violations, for instance, and now we've got this one where they're coming in and mailing them the ticket. Um, it, it, some of us have a concern that we're heading down a road here that it want, might be one we're not interested in going down. However, I noticed that the law, as currently written, specifically states, uh, in effect, no warrant is necessary. You have the right to inspect without a warrant. 
Can, can you comment on how the department developed that and, and where we might be able to draw a bright line here that protects civil liberties but still keeps us from keeps commerce moving? Well, Mr. Chair, thanks. I, I, all, I have heartburn with that as well. Mm -hmm. And my enforcement philosophy and what I share with the over 100 people that I supervise, that's not the type of enforcement that I want them to take. Mm -hmm. And civil, civil weight is just a small portion of what we do. Our troopers are out there. Uh, I'll use the Northwest region for example. There are four mobile people in almost 20 counties assigned to commercial vehicle enforcement. We have 10 people assigned to the two fixed scale facilities. So we're not able to go out and do a lot of roadside weight enforcement with portable scales. We use that civil weight uh, law as a tool to to do enforcement. Thank you for your explanation. I appreciate that. Um, uh, if uh, there are any, are there any other questions for this testifier, I do have three other people I'd like to speak about this bill. Uh, John Appitz, um, Rob Vanasek, uh, and Abby um, Burdick. All right, if you're all related and when you're speaking in the same vein, you may come together. Otherwise, we'll just take one at a time here. Okay. I'll tell you what, let's have uh, Rob and uh, Abby, uh, why don't you have a seat there and we'll chat with you about this bill. And then Mr. Appitz, we'll have you next, okay? Welcome to the committee. Ms. Burdick in particular used to sit over here and run this show, now you're over there. I, that's weird. <laughs> Once upon a time. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Abby Breidek. I'm here today representing the Association of Minnesota Counties, okay. also in collaboration with the Minnesota County Engineers Association. Um, I want to thank Representative Keel for being uh, open to having a good dialogue about this bill. We certainly like the, the um, amended version rather than the first. Um, our concerns are pretty um, simple, broad-based, in that um, we really are hesitant, hesitant toward anything that would undermine the State Patrol's ability to enforce weight limits on our county and township roads. Because many of our roads were never built to that 10 ton road standard, it's important that the limits uh, that are in place statutorily are able to be enforced. Um, regarding the 150 mile first haul language, um, if anything this might be a short term gain for the heavy load carriers, as you know, as we've discussed, it, it triples um, the roads that would need more maintenance, which could trigger um, an eventual rise in property taxes to maintain those roads. And I, we understand, while we understand in some rural areas it might be hard to get to a grain elevator within 50 miles, but in the rest of the state, um, this could be seen as overly permissive. Um, and perhaps there's something more specific we can get to in order to accommodate those folks that are in the, the real sparse rural areas. Um, regarding the reduction from 14 to 7 days to check for the permits, as the State Patrol, men, Patrol mentioned, they don't always have the resources available um, to check those records within 7 days. Um, so with few, fewer deputies on the road, um, we want to make sure that State Patrol has the right parameters in place to support the weight limits and ultimately the preservation of our local roads and bridges for everyone's safety. Thank you, Ms. Burdick. Uh, Mr. Benassi, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Good afternoon. Uh, Rob, my name is Rob Vanasik here on behalf of the Minnesota Association of um, the Townships. Uh, the, uh, Minnesota, the association is in opposition to this bill. Um, we've ex expressed our concerns to the author. Um, and I'll, I'll give you in part uh, some of our policy um, position, the Cliffs Notes version, which is townships uh, must retain the ability to impose local weight limits on township roads so as to protect the safety of the general public when using roads that are not designed for extra heavy vehicles. Further, except when determined essential for other public safety needs, uh, the association opposes the granting by the legislature of exemptions from statewide and local limits. Um, so our concern um, <coughs> with this bill is the tripling of the radius from 50 miles to 150 miles um, that the extra 10% uh, uh, weight hauling on the first haul will be allowed. Um, you know, we've... Uh, uh, that being said, many of our members are also uh, in the agriculture industry and know um, some of the struggles in certain parts of the state where 
there are uh, limits. Uh, there is a, a limited access to elevators. Um, so uh, if we, uh, we really appreciate the uh, uh, author's um, delete everything amendments before you. Um, however, if uh, this could be narrowed uh, a little bit more to the northwest, maybe four or five counties up in the valley um, where the problem is, uh, uh, that would get at some of our concerns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bonasic. Are there questions for either of these two testifiers members? Seeing none, uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, Mr. Appitz, uh, do you have Mr. Wagner with you today also? I do indeed, Mr. Chairman. We're always honored to have him in our committee as well. If definitely, like to definitely. Um, have Mr. Chairman. Place there. It's yeah, let's step right up there. Great. Abby's helping with our uh, our media production here. <coughs> Fruit as it may be, we're going to use a couple maps if we may, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yeah, Chairman, my name is John Appitz. Uh, I'm with the law firm of Messerly and Kramer, and I represent the Minnesota Regional Railroads Association, the short line railroads that are basically your, re your retail haulers across the uh, across the state of Minnesota. And uh, this is Mark Wagner, the president of the Twin Cities and Western Railroad. You saw his presentation a couple nights ago when he was talking about the Minnesota Prairie Line, which yeah. they're the operators of as well. Um, and I'd just like to go to two points. I know you're going to hear a lot of testimony from other folks as well. And uh, I appreciate that the author gave us some time to talk about this uh, uh, last Friday. But the two points that I'd like to make real quickly is the more freight you put on trucks and the more freight you put on the roads, the less, the more freight you take off of the railroads. You take it off of the railroads, you divert it. And um, it unbalances the, uh, the, the the structure, the economic structure that's now in place. Uh, the concern was that there's a great distance that has to be hauled in this first haul uh, from uh, the field or from the um, storage bin that's on the farm, typically, to an elevator facility. Well, I show you the uh, right here a map of the railroads in the state of Minnesota. But what I really like to do is overlay it with a map, and these are MnDOT's maps. These aren't my maps. These are MnDOT's maps. A map of the terminal facilities that are located on those railroads uh, throughout Minnesota. These are these are the facilities where you can drop your uh, your drop your production your. Um, uh, uh, agricultural production and have it shipped across the a nation wherever you want to go there's 40 of these different the green dots are the ones you're looking at 40 of these different uh, terminal uh, facilities that are on railroads around the state of Minnesota but that's kind of the if you will the arterial arterial network that's in place there's a there are I just checked this uh, 10 minutes ago um, between 650 and 651 uh, local elevators that are existing all over the state of Minnesota in different locations where uh, producers are able to haul their pro haul their production. I don't know if Mr. Zelinka is going to be able to speak to that, but what basically you do is it's it's hauled to those particular locations, um, may go to a terminal elevator, and then moves across the uh, across the state uh, either to the ports or out to the Pacific Northwest on the BN, the UP, the CP, the CN, whatever it might be. So um, that's the network that's in place today. The first haul allows you to get there. Mr. Extending it 150 miles from the 100 to the 150 miles means you can basically go to a lot of other places and circumvent a lot of those uh, small country elevators that may be, um, may be depending right now on that produce coming to them. Mr. Appitz? Yes, sir. Excuse help me. Us out. I see the little uh, distance key in the lower right hand. What's that first red, uh, little red uh, mark? Is that 50 first miles? Red, the first one right here is 20 miles. 20. OK, that 20 helps us right a great deal. Mm -hmm. And that takes out the 80 miles right there is 80 miles. So twice that would be about 100 and, uh, 100 Understood. 150 miles. That's helpful. Yeah, Thank you. That, I guess that is. Uh, Please proceed. Or Thank right you, Mr. There. Chairman. The other point that I want to make real briefly and then offer the, the podium to, uh, to Mr. Wagner, is that, um, and I think you've heard it just a couple of minutes ago, overweight trucks hauling on the highways create more damage on the roads, especially the rural roads and especially the rural highways and bridges. Um, generally, as Mr. Clavin said, and I respect him um, immensely, Mr. Clavin said there's an 80-pound limit on the roads, generally speaking, Maybe except in a number of instances where 
uh, you can you can haul more. You heard about the 10% exemption. There's a 25% exemption. There's a 4% exemption. Read through the statute; it'll make you nuts. Uh, but there are exemptions all over the place, and um, we've created these over the last oh, roughly decade by allowing forest products, which came first, and originally that was going to be timber. Some of you heard the speech last year, so I'm going to be really quick. Uh, but that used to be just timber that came out of the plant. And uh, now it's uh, particle board, now it's uh, moving a variety of different sorts of uh, timber products and wood products up to 200 miles on the first haul from one location to another. We added uh, ag products uh, a couple of years thereafter. Dairy trucks came next, and then dairy trucks can now haul not just, not just milk, but you haul butter, cheese, cream from one location to another. Uh, last year we talked about aggregate, and some of you remember we were talking about sweet corn, and sweet corn's got the problem that it's got dirt on it, and th therefore there should be bigger <laughs> trucks because of that. And what happens is with each one of these new exemptions that we talk about, it's based on the precedent from the last one. So you got to go back to the timber exemption that we created, the first haul for timber products, to really appreciate um, how this kind of creeps forward. You folks are the first line of defense for the transportation system in this state. You are the first line of defense uh, for the highways, for the railroads, and other places. And there's a simple equation that you need to kind of keep in mind, and that is that more weight and more distance equal more damage to the highways, the railroads, and the bridges. Indeed, um, Mr. Goth here, the bridges on the highways, on the uh, road work, of, excuse me, on the transportation network in Minnesota. So we're just asking that, you know, not to carve out yet another exemption, and hopefully, um, Keep the balance in place and keep and continue to protect our roads. Thank you, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mark Wagner, President, Twin City and Western Railroad and Minnesota Prairie Line Railroads. Um, <clears throat> it gives me heartburn to testify here today because our railroads are 95 percent dependent on the ag industry. Uh, it's our it's our bread and butter. Um, our railroads were formed after the large railroads did not. Uh, there was enough density to operate them, so we tried to create uh, rail opportunities uh, on much leaner um, principles than our large railroad brethren do. And every time the weight limits are increased, we see a noticeable uh, reduction in product coming to our elevators. Um, what this does is it enables uh, the shippers to ship uh, to elevators on the large railroads, as opposed to shipping it to our elevators and then we bring it in to the big railroads for shipment across the country. And so um, the argument that you have, and this isn't this bill, but the argument you generally hear with bigger trucks is bigger trucks means fewer trucks. Well, actually what it does is it gives them better economies so they can price more aggressively and we wind up losing the business. And so. Um, the state needs to look into the future. If you look at the map, there are many lines that aren't on it that were on it uh, 40 years ago. Uh, the rail industry really has declined. It's starting to pick back up now with rising fuel prices and uh, the environmental friendliness of rail. It's picking back up, but this, this bill allowing the going from 50 to 150 miles will have a material effect on our railroads' long-term viability. So I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Bogle. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, Mr. Apitz, uh, thank you for your testimony. Just um, wondering, though, if we're looking at uh, stepping into the 21st century here and we look at the size of farms today compared to 40 years ago, um, they're hugely different. And, I mean, we have farmers from Wilmer who farm up by Fargo and own land up there. So, and, and today's farmer now has the, the capability of storing hundreds of thousands of, you know, bushels of, of grain themselves, each one. I mean, several of them will. So I think what we're looking at, though, here is to, to give them the opportunity to haul that grain back to their, to their own home place where they can store that themselves until, until uh, the market is to, in, a, in a place where they want to sell it. You know, and if they haul it to a local grain elevator, typically they're either going to have to pay a storage fee there if they're going to store the grain there, or they're going to have to sell it at 
uh, at the market price. So I think what, well, from my understanding of this, it's not that we're trying to go after the railroads and trying to get them. We're trying to just help the farmers out to be able to uh, to better manage their their operations and to uh, because uh, you know they now farm thousands of acres instead of just a, a few hundred. Um, I think we have to look at that as being one of the reasons why we're looking at doing this. Mr. Abbott, do you care to respond to the? Uh... Just briefly, Mr. Chairman, we're not, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Vogel, we're not challenging the right and the need to move a lot of produce to different locations around the state. What this simply does is say you can put it on a bigger truck, you can exceed the weight limits that the road is designed to carry and move it to a location someplace around the state. Move it in an 80,000 pound truck and everything's fine. But Mr. Abbott, that was to be my clarifying question. As I understand the bill, anybody could put anything they want on a truck at 80,000 pounds and drive it from one end of the state to the other if they wish. The only thing that is being looked at here is the first haul 10% over exemption is being extended from a 50 mile radius to 150. Is that way you understand the bill? That's correct. Mr. Thank you for the mm -hmm. clarification. Further questions for either of these testifiers? Questions or comments? Um, I also have uh, Steve Frank uh, from AAA. Mr. Frank, would you care to come and testify? Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Mr. Wagner, thank you for your testimony. Uh, who's asking for recognition? Over here. Oh, Representative Leidiger. Was our intention to lay this bill yeah, over? This bill is going to be laid over because there's a little more work needs to be done on thank it before you. we take a vote. But uh, we might as well have good discussion while these uh, folks are here today. Frank, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record and the folks Mr. watching. Mr. Chairman, all thank you. My name is Stephen Frank. I'm the President Chief Executive Officer of AAA Minneapolis, and I'm speaking in opposition to the bill. Uh, we have 700,000 motorist members in the state of Minnesota, and our effort in our organization in over its 100-year history has been concentrated on the safety of our transportation system for motorists and the integrity of our roads. Uh, we've looked at the, uh, as Mr. Appitz just described it, the camel's nose in the tent over the last few years with continual exemptions for one kind or another and are very concerned about it, particularly as it relates to uh, the integrity of our roads and bridges and particularly as it affects motorists as they interact with heavy trucks. Uh, as, as, as you know, uh, the federal standard for interstate highways limits uh, loads to 80,000 pounds. Uh, it is our view that if the first haul was extended to 150 miles at over 80,000 pounds and those vehicles were operating off the interstate highway system as they must be, they would be on our smaller roads, our two-lane roads, where according to DPS statistics, they are 260% more likely to have a traffic crash with a motor vehicle and 560% more likely to be involved in a fatal crash. So our opposition is very simple. We think the current standard is sufficient. We have been given assurances in the past that more special interests would not come forward as an additional exemption was made, and we've seen it not to be true. Thank you, Mr. Frank, for your testimony. Is there uh, questions for the testifier or comments? Uh, Representative Nelson, are you uh, waving? To the bill as a whole. All right, to the bill as a whole. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. It's noted for the record. Anyone else in the audience like to testify for, against, or about this bill? Sir, come down. Please identify yourself. Uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my name is Bob Zelenka. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Grain and Feed Association. We represent country grain elevators and feed mills here in the state of Minnesota. Um, the, the bill, uh, we uh, have been very supportive of uh, the past uh, efforts to bring down the amount of time we have to keep scale tickets, and that's why we support that part of the bill. The bringing it down from 14 to 7 days makes our job a lot easier, um, the less hassle problem we have is we have some members that like to do away with this entirely. Uh, some elevators get visited a lot. A lot of elevators don't get visited at all. Uh, we've tried to work with the department, uh, the patrol. They've been good to work with over the years about trying to, to manage that. Uh, but do we uh, see the, the option of more roadsides is not a very viable option either. So this is probably a good uh, balance to, to bring it down to seven days for us keeping the scale tickets. and. In terms of the uh, 50 to 150 miles, um, we don't. Do we have mixed feelings on that? We have um, some of our larger shippers that don't have a concern over that. I have some smaller elevators that do have a concern over that. So we, 
you know, easily don't have a position on that particular issue, which has been the most controversial part of that. But in terms of the uh, dealing with scale tickets and bringing it down to seven days, that's our biggest uh, point of uh, interest and support. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments for Mr. Zelenska? Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Zelenska, uh, for pointing yourself out. Members, before we uh, go back to discussion on the bill, um, just a sidebar, you remember here last time, um, there was a really groovy ringtone from Representative Shemansky's phone. He was busted and he was fined. He is now about to pay the fine. So, Representative Shemansky, if you'd like to tell us what you're going to pass around. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was going to bring some onion uh, snacks, but uh, <laughs> I was short of onions but long on apples. So, I have some apple cookies for the committee. <laughs> apple and cookies the, today. And the Thank staff around the table here. The chair would not have been amused had they been onion cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, did uh, I was just wondering if uh, Representative Shemansky uh, made those himself. Representative Shemansky, <laughs> you can answer the question if you wish. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, they were uh, about 13 hours old when I brought them in. Oh, hey, there we go. These are fresh ones. Okay, members, if you can pay attention and uh, to Representative Keel while we're uh, yes. uh, helping with snacks, uh, we can uh, do that. Uh, Captain, do you want to come back and testify some, a few other things? Captain Rogotsky, uh, please, and then, uh, okay. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions and concerns that were raised about uh, when I had conversation with Representative Keel was in line 4.14 and the 30 days. Uh, when we do pull weight slips, it the, the challenge is to determine who the carrier was. So we have to run a registration check and determine who, who the registered owner is. And, and I've had many times where farmers or whoever they are may be on vacation for several weeks at a time. We'll send a letter. They'll come back from vacation and let us know that they sold the truck a month ago. So then we have to track down who the current owner is. So I would see that the 30 days would be problematic to file a completed case. And then the other uh, point, Mr. Chair, that I wanted to bring up was the, that we're preparing for the legislative audit on our weight program. And we've been developing relationships with MnDOT. We're looking at different technology. There's a lot of different things that we're trying to do to gear up for this. And I'm just wondering how this might turn out next year. Okay. Thank you for your uh, questions or your comments. Appreciate that. And members, yes, we do have a legislative audit commission look at weights, enforcements, and so on and so forth. Uh, Representative Nelson, before you bite into your cookie, you have the floor for a moment. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for warning me before I bit into the cookie. Looks rather good. Um, I guess when the maps were up there and I was looking at that, and the, I guess the concerns I have is number one is the 150 the mile radius. I mean, I can drive from my house in Brooklyn Park, probably almost to my cousin's farm down near Worthington, and that's less than 150 miles, um, or right about there. I know I can drive from my house to farther than Brainerd, and uh, that's, that's less than 150 miles. So, I mean, that's that seems to be a little excessive in that. That's a concern I have. The other is just comment about, you know, we're t if we're going to be destroying our roads, and these are government property, it's, it's not a lot different than somebody going and spray painting the side of the Capitol and they get caught on camera doing that, we're going to prosecute and go after them because they're destroying government property also. These, our roads are our, are our investment in our infrastructure that allows our businesses to prosper in the state and we, don't want, we want to make sure we're guarding those, guarding those well. That's our, that's our duty here as Transportation Committee. And so, I mean, that's a concern I have. So I guess those are just my couple of comments here. Thank you. We'll take that as to the bill as amended. Thank you. Uh, Representative Morrow. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I don't, did, did you have more testifiers on your list? No. Okay. Mr. Chair, uh, you know, we've been talking about truck weights and truck weight issues and exemptions and enforcement throughout your and my time here together. Um, and I had the opportunity to bring the State Patrol and the farm groups uh, and others uh, down to St. Peter to talk about this during the interim. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm glad we're laying the bill over, uh, and that's not a remark. I think, Representative Keel, you've, had, you've opened up an area of discussion mm -hmm. that, Mr. Chair, my advice is going to be, given the legislative auditor report, uh, we've had no testimony today regarding truck sizes and the future of truck sizes. Uh, we have a number of 
group to have a number of issues on truck weights who we didn't hear from today. I know there's an attempt to make this a very narrow bill, but you and I both know that this very narrow bill becomes very wide. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, I guess my advice would be uh, if we don't uh, create the peace and the value needed to move this bill over, I hope you'll consider having uh, either a hearing or a meeting during the interim to discuss truck weights and truck weight issues on a broader basis. Thank you, Representative Morrow. And we do have deadlines coming up around the middle of March and probably have some room to talk about those things after we get the bills through deadlines. Further questions or comments? And is there anyone else in the audience that needs to testify for or against this bill? Representative Kiel, seeing none, um, you've heard great committee work here today, a lot of discussion uh, uh, about, for, and against. And um, so we're going to lay the bill as amended over and uh, trust that when we bring it up again, the Perhaps some that some of this will be given consideration as we move forward. President Mr. Chair, you like the last word? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to point out uh, just a real quick, non terribly issue, but I know Mr. Appet suggested that um, we worry about dirt and corn, and, and I just wanted to point out that we really hope there's no dirt and corn because that should be cleaner or soybeans. Um, you don't want, you would want beans smeared. Um, but I would point out that that's probably more like the dirt in uh, carrots or, or um, sugar beets or uh, uh, potatoes. Just wanted to point that out. They, they do come out pretty muddy sometimes. Um, and we actually try to get as much mud as we can off because in sugar beet land we get docked for dirt. So it costs, costs us money, both hauling it and, and selling it. Um, but I also want to point out that, I, you know, I'm very, very, uh, it's very important to take care of our smaller elevators. I, you know, it's, it's, it's a small business and I want to make sure that we have those. Those are important um, and, and I have no intent of trying to shut them down and let people haul farther. And I don't really think the intent here is for farmers to be able to haul. In fact, I know that if I decided to haul to the Duluth port, I had much larger requirements on my trucks. I couldn't just... Uh, get in my farm truck and drive to Duluth and and I do know farmers that from time to time will do that um, to make money but and and also that the roads that we drive on are important for for our agricultural community both in uh, the fact that we can get our product there and the fact that we need to take care of them and just a small I've heard this conversation every once in a while well everybody um, you know uh, consumers pay for roads but I want to point out that farmers pay for roads also. And, um, and they're very important to that rural area. And so um, I really thank you all for having this conversation. It's been a real education to me. And um, I think I made everybody unhappy, so I figure somewhere I'm in the middle. No. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, but I thank you very much. And uh, thank you, members. With that, House Bill 25, 2058, as amended, is laid over. Thank you, Representative Keel. Uh, Representative Benson, House File 2239, and uh, I don't believe you have amendments. Oh, yes, we do. Uh, in just a moment here, I have to see if there's, uh, uh, if you want to go ahead and move your bill. Members, um, <coughs> Representative Hornstein, I don't see. Could we have uh, Peace in the Valley on the 24-hour rule? Uh, members, it's, it's, it doesn't make the 24-hour rule, but I think we checked with, uh, let's see, tomorrow. Uh, yes, I, I spoke to, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I spoke with uh, Representative Hornstein and Morrow about it, and uh, they were, they were fine with it. Fine with it. Okay, yep. Thank you. Then we'll proceed with the, the chair will waive the 24-hour rule in light of that. Thank you. So if you'd like to move the bill and put it before us, it's going to go to the general register, and then you can move your 8-1 amendment. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move 2239 for it to pass and go to the general register. Okay, and the bill is in front of us, and you have uh, an A-1 amendment. Right? And I'd like to move the A-1 amendment. Members, the A-1 amendment is in front of us. If you'll give us just a moment, it's an event until everyone sees it, and then we'll talk about the A-1 amendment. Thank you for the pause, Representative Benson. I get to finish my first cookie. Appreciate it. 
If you would explain what the A1 amendment does to your bill, we'd, uh, the committee would appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the A1 amendment is a technical amendment that, uh, that goes to or speaks to some of uh, drilling it down a little bit farther in terms of uh, the requirements of the bill. Um, it adds some clarification, as you can see, by uh, each of the lines. And uh, the first one, for example, in 10, it adds after 1936 and is totally original as, as, law, as far as, and, and along with or, as, or is a restored pioneer plate. Um, the comma that's inserted after one of 11, item. In 115, strike uh, number of the and after the model insert designation um, speaks to, I, I, you know, it's easier to explain after we get the bill out okay. that what we're talking about here is, okay. is VIN block numbers that are stamped on the block versus a VIN number that's made up. Mm -hmm. um, went, I've uh, with me today uh, Mr. Uh, Hoonsbin, and uh, he's going to speak to the more technical nature of the things. Um, as we go through through the bill, I'm going to talk to the general nature of why it was brought to me. And, and uh, uh, well, I think the committee is satisfied that the amendment is indeed a technical amendment. So let's vote on the amendment. Questions or discussion? The amendment members, seeing none, all in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. 2239, as amended, is in front of us. If you'd like to introduce your witness and proceed, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Gary Hoonsman uh, after I give a kind of a general overview of why the why we need the bill, and, and uh, I, I think it was brought to me because uh, I'm a motorhead. I, I think that I'm on this in the SEMA caucus, and uh, they were looking for somebody that was uh, uh, at, at least sympathetic to the cause of people who love cars. And uh, I know maybe there might be uh, many of you other uh, that are part of the the. Uh, the SEMA caucus, but uh, nevertheless, it was brought to me, and it was compelling in that uh, uh, having b been an owner previously of a, an older car and knowing the amount of work that goes into it, uh, these things can be extremely expensive very quickly. And uh, anything that might add to their grief in terms of uh, reducing their value because of something or a de designation on the title would be uh, something that we'd want to try to rectify. Um, and I might also add that if you look at the top of the bill, this is probably the only bill that I'll present uh, uh, this, this entire legislative session that will have a co-author that will be as bipartisan as this bill, <laughs> since uh, Representative Kahn's on the bill. And, uh, and, and her, and her tie-in here, of course, is that uh, uh, if Gary doesn't drop his name, I will. One of the other test, uh, the people who came to the office was uh, uh, Judge Alan Page. Uh, and he owns a 1906 Buick, 1910. 1910. He's going to correct me with all these, but uh, 1910 Buick. And uh, the trouble that he had to go through after he spent uh, loads of money on uh, restoring this vehicle and then still ended up with a, a title that uh, didn't signify, uh, said a reconstructed uh, vehicle and a year, 2011? 10. Uh, 10. Uh, that took two years and, uh, you know, uh, lowers the value. So three years to get it. So, uh, in essence, basically what goes on now, if you were to find a, an old vehicle in a, in a, in a barn like that and, or pay somebody for an old vehicle that needs to uh, have lots of restoration, uh, when you're all done, uh, there's a process you go through. You take the pictures and so on, and, and I'll let Gary get into those details. But ultimately what happens is you get a title that says it's a reconstructed vehicle and uh, it will have a new VIN number that doesn't correspond to any numbers that were previously on the vehicle. And it will um, also have the year of the title being exactly when uh, you, you applied or they, get, or they gave you the title for it, uh, rather than uh, the year the a car actually is or the identifying mark. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you know anything about fixing old cars, especially ones that old, unless you're going to do all the work yourself, you can have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in these old vehicles, and suddenly it's a 19... Uh, it's a 2010 or 11, and it's reconstructed, and it, it has a significantly lesser value, uh, among other things. So that's, that's the intent of the bill, is to correct that and create a, a, a titling process that allows for cars that are manufactured from 1935 and older or uh, older than uh, 1936 uh, to have a pioneer plate 
and a title that says uh, uh, restored rather than reconstructed and it to have the proper numbers that already are stamped on the block. So with that, let's have um, uh, Mr. Hoonsbein. Hoonsbein, is it? Uh, if you identify yourself with a recorded record and proceed with your testimony, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, my name is Gary Honesbean, and I'm from Crystal, Minnesota. I've been involved with antique car restorations since uh, the late 40s when I was just a young kid. And I represent uh, a relatively small group of people in the state of Minnesota, uh, a few hundred maybe, that pull old cars from barns and bring them back to life as historical vehicles. And up until about two years ago, this was not a problem. We were able to uh, find old cars. We would take four pictures of the car, one from each corner. We would write a little history about the car. And we would put a value on the car and send it to the state of Minnesota. In a short period of time, uh, they would look, review what we, what we had done and would send us back a letter saying that uh, in order to get a title, you'll have to place a bond on this car for one and a half times of the value that we agreed that the car is worth. That's a relatively simple procedure other than paying for a bond, but it did work. But in more recent years, it's become an inconsistent procedure. Uh, most recently, as uh, Senator Representative Benson said, uh, three of our members received letters back from the state and saying, well, you restored this car or you reconstructed this car because you built a new wooden body for it or you put a postery on it or you replaced the old rotted wooden wheels. So we're not going to give you a pioneer title for this car. We're going to force you to title it as a current age car and we're going to give it a, a serial number and uh, we're going to make you call it a reconstructed car with a collector's plate. Well, we don't want that. We want the, the rules to be clarified, not changed, but clarified. We want the name of the original manufacturer of the car clearly on the title. We want to retain the vehicle's identification number. Every manufacturer of cars from 1900 put a number on their car of some sort. It might be an alphanumeric, alphanumerical character. Uh, it might be uh, uh, all numbers, uh, in anywhere from four or five numbers on up to eight or nine numbers. But it's usually stamped someplace in the car, on the transmission, on the cover case, on the frame, but it's there. We want to recognize on our titles the year that the car was originally manufactured. A 1910 Buick is not a 19 or 2010 Buick. We also want the, the vehicle's model designation put on the title, as it has been in the past in most cases. It's a Model T Ford. It's a Model A Ford. It's a Model B Cadillac, so forth. And we want this to be titled as a pioneer vehicle. Any vehicle prior to 1936 is considered a pioneer vehicle, and it's issued a pioneer plate. And we want to retain those features because we feel that these are historical vehicles. They're not just collectors, but they're historical. And the reason we have pioneer plates is to recognize that place in history. There is some money involved in this, but I don't think that's the main reason. I have seven antique cars. Six of them I pulled out of the junk, restored them very carefully. When I say restored, I mean sometimes I have to replace the spokes and the wheels. I have to reupholster it. I may have to make a new wooden body. But we do this very carefully to make sure it represents exactly the way the car, as close as possible, came from the factory. We spend years looking for the right brass headlights or the right wheel rims or the right steering column. But this is part of the hobby, to restore these cars back to their original. Thank you for your testimony. We, I think we get the gist of the uh, importance of the bill and, and how it affects the, the pioneer plates. Uh, questions for the testifier for the author of the bill. Uh, members, is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify for, against, or about the bill? Uh, does DVS feel compelled, Pat, to talk about this? I see that she's coming. Uh, um, we're going to be directing them to issue the title, so perhaps we should let them uh, comment to the bill as amended.
And ma'am, if you'd identify yourself for the committee and proceed with your testimony and stand for questions, that'd be great. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Vicki Albu. Uh, my job is the Vehicle Services Program Director, and I report to Pat McCormick, the director. Mm -hmm. Ms. Albun, did you say? Albu, A-L-B-U. Um, if you'd proceed to the testimony, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Um, the department agrees that it would be, it would simplify things, it would be helpful to simplify things, but it is not always so simple. Um, there are two key issues. Uh, one is the reconstruction brand and what you call the vehicle so that we can issue a title that accurately describes the vehicle. And the second is the vehicle identification number assignment. And those are important for many reasons, but one of which is it's important to the owner that it describe the vehicle accurately and that it have the accurate vehicle identification number. It's important to the insurance companies in case the vehicle is stolen. And um, I, we know it's important to the car collectors because they care passionately as, as we know about um, what these vehicles are termed. So um, I just wanted to um, clarify a few things. There, there, if the vehicle isn't a, a, it's primarily parts from one vehicle, a 1910 Buick, for example, it's not as problematic. Um, if there's no proof of ownership, no existing certificate of title, um, Mr. Hoon's been um, described the process for obtaining a, a title with, by posting a bond. Yes. Um, but if it, the problem comes when either the body or the frame or some major component part of the vehicle is not from the same model year and make of the vehicle. And then what do you call that? Um, all state DMVs throughout the country wrestle with this issue and every state has practically a different solution. Um, I wish there were one, you know, simple, easy solution. So these, these, these are handled on a case-by-case -case basis and there is, I, I admit, there's a lot of back and forth, writing letters, requesting additional information if it's not real cut and dried on the surface as to what this vehicle is. And um, so uh, it can be complicated. Um, when the parts are not from the same model year and make a vehicle, we have struggled with what to call that. And, and it is a case-by-case -case decision. What does it look like? Um, does it look like a 1910 Buick or is it a street rod, for example? I mean, there's several different classifications of a collector type vehicles. So I think those are the situations that have caused the problems. And um, it would be helpful to clarify what do you call a vehicle when you have a, a 1906 frame and a 1910 body what model year is that? What is the make? Um, is it reconstructed? Or, um, and, and we also wondered about the, if the intent was to have restored as a brand on the title. That would be helpful probably to the consumer who would know then, is this a complete <coughs> original 1910 Buick or is it a, a modified vehicle? Um, and then as, in regards to the vehicle identification number, manufacturers have changed. Uh, before 1954, there weren't uh, vehicle identification numbers like we know today and manufacturers varied greatly. Um, these experts probably can tell you a lot more than I can about that, but we have resources that we look at, books, publications, nationally available materials that um, we use to try to identify um, where should the, the identifying number on this vehicle be for this particular year and make a vehicle. And I brought an example if anyone cares, but it, it, it's, it's not always very straightforward. So I just want to say that it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to uh, simplify. But I'm in favor of it if we can figure out how to do that. Uh, thank you, Ms. Albu. Um, uh, this is not un uh, very dissimilar from rebuilding airplanes from parts. And it, yeah, we uh, struggle with that sometimes, too, on what serial numbers are involved. And uh, um, so I can imagine and, and, I, and understand the passion that goes with this. Um, Let's see, I had a question here before somebody slipped me a note that Johnny Cash had a song about this very problem, I believe, Representative. <laughs> <laughs> this member shall bring treats to the next, uh, <laughs> to the next committee hearing. Here you go, Representative. Um, <laughs> Representative Benson, I remember what it was now. Is there a Senate companion to this bill yet, and how is it? <laughs> uh, yes, there is. And it. it it's exactly the same as 2, uh, 2239, but i got to get the, 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 uh, the, the amendment. amendment. My question is, is there uh, an opportunity um, to work with the enthusiasts, particularly to help describe the value and, and the, what we're talking about here? Because obviously, Ms. Halbu raises a good point. This is not a street rod. 
um, kind of thing. These are actually authentic restorations of cars, largely as they left the showroom, I'm assuming, which is a different kind of deal. We're talking 15, 20 cars a year. Is there a possibility in the next week or so, if we pass this one to the general register, that you could work some things out that might actually ha have some a consensus of thinking and put that in the Senate file? And I then, could. Uh, um, I, I think there are some of the questions, though, that we can answer uh, in terms of the concerns that were raised. Okay. Well, let's do that here in the next few minutes. We're now uh, two minutes past our uh, committee time, and I want to be respectful of the public. <laughs> Uh, public's expectation of the committee. So this will be the last bill. We'll take up the uh, uh, move over, slow down bill in the next committee members. So uh, let's uh, go ahead with your uh, testimony, Mr. Hoonsbeam, regarding uh, your comments to the comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one thing you mentioned that uh, 10, 20 cars a year, it's probably closer to five cars a year okay. that have this kind of problem. It's not something that should be blown completely out of proportion. Mm -hmm. Um, when we supply, when we uh, apply for a title on an untitled car, we we have to supply four pictures of the car from four different positions. We also have to take a picture of the VIN number supplied by the manufacturer. And in all the years I've been working on antique cars, I've never found a car that didn't have a number stamped on that can be photographed and included. In fact, I can show you probably 20 or 30 examples where the Motor Vehicle Department has already assigned numbers off from old vehicles that don't even come close to our current VIN number system. I have one car that's numbered 29, for instance. That's the number that was stamped on the block, and all of a sudden they decided they didn't want to do that. In the case of Representative, uh, in the case of Chief Justice Alan Page, they uh, put a number on the title, and a paper sticker was placed on the gas tank of the car as the identification number, and this is unacceptable. That number has to represent the manufacturer's number, and we bond these cars for one and a half times its value at a cost between five hundred and a thousand dollars to protect the state. And no collector in this business is going to cheat by putting a different motor in a car that is the wrong motor. That's part of this hobby is to restore these things back to their original nature without fooling around with things like that. We spend most of our time looking for the correct bolts, wheels, nuts, engines, and so forth. I, I just don't think the problem is that serious that uh, with pictures, with the, with the bonding and everything, I think we should be fairly well covered on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would ask that, that we pass the bill and, and have it um, be referred to the register. I'd be happy to work out if there's some clarifying language to ensure that we're not talking about street rods, we're talking about uh, you know original restora restorations that would help you know, bring uh, the agency on board with us. I'm fine with that. We can get that done in pretty quick order, I think. And you can work with the Senate author to Absolutely. make sure the timing works so they don't get ahead of you. Right. Okay. Further questions for this witness or for the author of the bill? Ms. Albu, thank you for expressing your concerns. I think the author has heard them, and we'll be looking to see that if, uh, this uh, gets worked on a little more. With that, members, um, at, let's see, we did vote on the amendment. Uh, the bill as amended is before us to the General Register. Representative Benson's renewed his motion. Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the motion prevails. You're on your way to the General Register, and we're looking forward to your floor amendment. Members will be Wednesday uh, downstairs in the basement. Uh, the agenda will be posted shortly, and we'll take up uh, 1955 and others on Wednesday. With that, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>